So, so, so anatomy goes first. What you can expect on anatomy? Um, in the study guide, did you see the do? You can expect the do. So you identify body regions. Is that clear? So you can expect body regions. You can expect identification of body cavities. Abdomen and pelvic regions. All can be there. Good? Clear? You can expect questions, and those questions can be both on the kind of anatomy physiology um, exams. Nose to the ears is medium. Make sense? Palms to the elbow distal. That kind of question. I may use, instead of nose to the ears, nasal to auricular is make sense palmar to olecranal is am i clear if you're curious which body regions i can ask about only the ones that are on the study guide next to the dude i promise you will not see any new words Am I clear? Uh, now it is. Thank you. I told you about tissues. I can even tell you there's going to be six questions. Last six questions are about tissues. And there are going to be some identifications of the skin. Okay? Now, another feature which Brandy can support, she evidenced that all images that will be on the exam are in the PowerPoint. Am I clear? You are not seeing anything new. Does that make sense? So if I show you the picture of the skin, it's the picture from the PowerPoint, I promise. And that if like I put all the pictures for all the exams on the blackboard, they are either in the PowerPoint like for this one, or for instance, for the bones in the future, all images, all photographs of the bones are on the blackboard. All photographs that will be on the exam are on the blackboard. Does that make sense? You don't want any surprises. I know that. And I appreciate it. Good. Any questions on the anatomy exam? Lecture exam, 50 questions. Only unit one, as Kelly asked. Okay, so. Homeostasis, feedback, organ system, all that bull crap. Tissues, skin, anatomical terminology. We're good? You are allowed to ask me questions during the exam. If it's not something like is B correct, then I'll try to help. Okay. Of course, in the anatomy, you're more than welcome to, like, um, can you clarify what number 33 points at? It's totally fine. That makes sense? Same with, like, if I show you a tissue, you can ask, what exactly? If there are multiple structures, you ask, what exactly do you want us to identify? And I'll show it. We good? First exam is really easy. It is to get you adjusted to the way I write this. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about the skin. So, very briefly, functionally, skin is protective, okay, first and foremost. Um, it actually protects against drying out. Uh, the main problem with patients who do not have skin, burn victims, is that they dehydrate like crazy. Protects against infection. This is why burn units are one of the, sterile, the most sterile units in the hospital. 
because you know exposed tissues is a, is a problem. Uh, thermal regulation is a big deal in in the skin, and you know identification things like that. So let's talk about the structure of the skin. What does it look like? So there are two main layers. And this is why, you know, I'm a sucker for flow charts. So you have epidermis and dermis. So epidermis is epithelial tissue. Dermis is the connective tissue. Good? Now, epidermis, let's expand it. It's the stratified squamous epithelium. So there's basement membrane right here. There's a layer of almost cuboidal cells that are called keratinocytes. Those are stem cells. And that is stratum basal. Okay, so basal layer, stratum basal. In addition to keratinocytes, you're going to find two more cell types in there. One will be, I'm going to just put labels on the cells, Merkel cell. It's the sensory cell. Okay? And another one will be melanocyte. We'll get to the role of melanocyte later. You good? Then you have a layer of cells that are still alive. So these guys, they can divide. This one, they cannot. So if this is stratum basali, this is going to be stratum spinoso. Okay, keratinocytes are alive. I'm going to put the nuclei here. Okay, still alive. Do not divide. But then you have a layer of basically dying keratinocytes. I deliberately do not draw any nucleus here. That's stratum granuloso. So at this point, keratinocytes, they die, and they're filled with keratin. Now, in some parts of the skin, specifically on your palms and on your soles, you have a third layer. I'm going to do it in a dashed line. Okay. So majority of the body does not have this layer, okay? It's a stratum lucidum. So basically the skin in which stratum lucidum is found is called a thick skin. Hands and feet. Good? And outermost, a multiple layer of flat, absolutely dead cells, okay? Filled with keratin. So this is stratum corneum. Does that make sense? You must know the order. Any questions? Just a little kind of interesting fact. By the time you leave this class, there are going to be several million skin cells under your seat. Your skin cell. You're constantly losing skin. There's an estimate that a person on average over the span of a lifetime, loses the amount of skin equivalent to this person's body. So for me, it's going to be about 180 pounds. Um, if I live longer. Questions on this? Okay. Few sort of beats about it. Um, we got miracle cells, right? Sensory, just sensory cells. Then here in this layer, I'm going to actually I'm going to remove one of these cells. I'm going to put something else. So this is the Langerhans cell. Okay, this is an immune cell in your skin that detects. Pathogens and you know initiates the protection against the pathogens. Make sense so far? 
So we've got Merkel, Sensory, Langerhans, immune. Now what about melanocyte? Melanocytes produce melanin. It's a pigment that gives our skin a specific color, darker or lighter. Now, this is something that I really want to focus your attention on. Here's the thing. Every person in this room has a gene, a DNA, okay, for melanin. Am I clear? Now, this gene in the DNA gets expressed. So we're talking DNA uh, transcribed into RNA. And RNA is translated into protein, protein melanin. So far, you're following me. Again, every person in this room has this gene. But just look at us. We have people in this room who all have darker skin, lighter skin, which means the amount of protein that is produced in our skin is different. Does that make sense? So skin color is determined by the expression of the melanin gene. People have higher expression, have darker skin. What's the role of melanin? It's protection for you, protection against UV light. Okay, with me so far? So, if you have kind of a fair skin, well, more or less, but then you go and you spend time outside in the sun, okay, you're gonna get suntan. Suntan is essentially accumulation of melanin in your skin to protect you from the UV light. Does that make sense? If there is no UV light, there's no sun, it's not going to be massively expressed. Are we clear? Now, I want to show you how evolution works and selective pressure works. If you would look at um, populations, human populations, from north to equator, you may notice kind of uniformly that people who live in uh, sort of cloudy northern countries, I'm not talking about pretty sometimes sunny Greenland and stuff, let's say Norway and Sweden and Finland, you look at those folks, they usually pretty very skinny because they sun exposure over thousands of years was minimal. Does that make sense? And if you move down, well, actually, we should, sorry, actually, we should go the other way around. Like, because people were spreading from Africa. So originally, people were exposed to sun a lot, and they had fairly dark skin. Does that make sense? So for folks who live down south, having dark skin is a huge advantage because they better protect it against tutelage. But as folks moved up north, it's not an advantage. So that feature eventually with generations got lost. Does that make sense? And you can see that skin color distribution. Now you ask, what about people with albinism? No expression. Do they have a gene? Do they have a gene? People with albinism. Yeah. It's just not being expressed. They do not produce any melanin at all. Does that make sense? Same story. Melanin defines not only skin color, hair color, eye color, it's all melanin. Got it? Uh, I have an example there, vitiligo. You know, uh, a, a patch of the skin that is basically white or hair patch that is white. It's the absence of melanin gene expression not systemically, but in that particular part of the skin. It's pretty common. Does that make sense? My son is a little bit No pathology whatsoever. It's not a pathological condition. Good? Any questions about that thing? Okay, let's talk about the dermis. Okay. 
basically two layers. Uh, so if you would look at the structures, this is dermis, this is epidermis. Now, epidermis and dermis are not separated by the straight line, so the line is kind of um, wavy. So these are called epidermal ridges. And these are called dermal papilla. So essentially your dermis and epidermis, they're like this. That make sense? So they don't like slide against each other. Good so far? You blink once, or well, yes, twice, but no. With masks, it's the most convenient way of communication. Dermis itself is kind of separated into papillary. So it's papillary layer. And this will be reticular. So uh, Brenna asked, you know, where do we find areola connective tissue? Papillary layer is areola connective tissue, and reticular is denser regular connective tissue. Okay. So far, any questions? Okay, some skin features. Um, friction ridges, also known as fingerprints. What do you need them for? No, I'm not talking about personal identification, no. What do you need friction ridges for? Friction. Good. Just, huh? Bingo. Grab fingers. You have friction ridges on your soles and on your fingers, right? Because those are the body parts that you use to grab or attach. But, okay? Good. Cleavage lines. Now, the importance of cleavage lines is um, your dermis is dense irregular connective tissue. Make sense? So you have collagen fibers running in different directions. Are you following it? No. Is that just that? You don't want to say just you know, no. So collagen fibers are running in different directions, but different body parts, different you know regions of the body. The main direction is done. There's a main direction. Okay. So cleavage line shows what is this direction. Does that make sense? Why it's important. Imagine that on my, I don't know, on my chest, the cleavage lines go like this. So the main direction for collagen fibers is vertical. So surgeon is doing some kind of a surgery on you. And the surgeon has to choose whether to cut my chest like this or like this. So collagen fibers run vertically. So if he cuts my chest like this, the wound will be very, very narrow. Does that make sense? But if uh, he cuts my chest like this, then collagen fibers will pull the edges of the wound. It will be wide and it will take longer time to heal. So basically cleavage lines 
they um, guide surgeons to follow the direction of the city. Yes. Oh, no. yeah, there are, you don't have to know these patterns, but there are patterns for each body part. Does that make sense? So like for, if a surgeon has to do some kind of a surgery with the leg, they will lose each part and they will cut along the position. Does that make sense? Okay. There's like the skin folds that skin accommodates the joints, but that's like not really important. So there are certain structures that are associated with this skin. And I'm gonna talk about one that I hate the most. I'm not gonna draw it. I hate nails. I don't like nails. I think they're the most boring structures. Okay? So I've got a nail bed it's under the nail that allows it to be nailed. Okay? I've got a nail fold that's basically connective tissue that folds over and holds the nail in the finger. Okay? You've got eponychium, which is like a woo here, and a hyponychium, the white stuff at the bottom of the overhanging edge of the nail. That makes sense? And this is your keratinocytes. That's basically skin. But that's the skin that is very much hard. Okay? Um, nail is transparent. The pink color is because of the blood vessels that run through the nail bed. Okay, this part is called nail body. Um, no nails do not grow in people die. They don't. People just, when they die, they kind of shrink a little bit. It looks like the nails become nails. That's it. Thank God, we're done with nails. I hate them. Another associated structure, hair. That's your skin, okay? And that's the hair, okay? Things to know. That's the hair shaft. Everything above the skin is the hair shaft. When people shave, they cut the shaft. Make sense? This is the root. Okay. This is sometimes called a follicle. This whole thing. Okay. Now, a couple of things. This is the matrix here. And you see this gap that I put here? It does not exist. I just put it for convenience to distinguish the hair from the connective tissue here, because this is hair pathway. So, hair matrix is the bunch of keratinocytes. Do I make sense? This is how hair grows. It's a kind of specialized keratinocytes. They divide and they push the layer up. Does that make sense? By the time your hair extends in the form of a shaft, all cells are dead. Does that make sense? So all these hair products that tell you that, you know, they will revitalize your hair, basically like, yeah, we're going to raise them from the dead. No, it's not going to happen, okay? Hair is dead, except for the matrix, which contains dividing keratinocytes legitimately but here's the kind of a reminder remember we mentioned that epithelial tissue is not vascularized 
but it has to get oxygen and nutrients. So hair papillae here is the connective tissue that contains blood vessels that nourish the hair, that deliver oxygen and nutrients and take away CO2 and stuff like that. Does it make sense? Now, a couple of things about hair. If you pull it, it will still grow. Because usually, if you do not pull all the matrix cells, then it will keep, you know, hair will keep growing. Does that make sense? However, if you burn it with a laser and just destroy everything in a blitz rate, then yes, it's gone forever. Okay? Got it? So kind of, you know, I didn't. Adjacent, I forgot to bring the razor, that's okay. Adjacent to the hair. Is the sebaceous gland. It's the holocrine gland, which means Every time it secretes, the secretion comes because the cells of the gland, they die and release everything. Does that make sense? Sebaceous gland produces sebum, which is the oily substance. This is where your skin is oily. Am I clear? So the purpose is to prevent your skin from dehydration, from drying, and to lubricate the hair. Can you tell me two locations on the human body where there are no sebaceous glands? They do not get oily. Huh? No, uh, eyelids don't. No, there are some. You just don't juice a lot there. And oil, in which locations oil will be a nuisance. Actually, there are some oily glands in the eye, but skin, skin. Where oil? So, yep, your palms and huh? soles of your feet. Yes, you don't want it to be slippery, right? So, sebaceous glands are not bad. Make sense? One of other functions of sebum may be antibacterial protection. And you have two types of, I'm going to simplify it. It's the sweat glands. Sweat glands <clears throat> can be apocrine and merocrine. So, what is the difference? Merocrine sweat glands, they have merocrine secretion. So it's the vesicles that contain basically what we sweat. Um, how do, what does that mean? If you work out outside or just, you know, if, when you're sweating because it's hot and you have, you know, sweat drops on your forehead or, or your torso, that is metacrine sweat. It's the thermoregulation. Am I clear? It evaporates and then regular. Apocrine sweat, that's the apocrine secretion, so a part of the cell gets chopped off and everything is relieved. It is a stinky sweat. Armpits, groins. Apocrine sweat actually isn't produced until about the age of 10, 11, 12. So like six-year-old, we have only American glass made up. So far, make sense? Please know the types of secretions. So sebaceous is a holocrine, merocrine sweat is the merocrine secretion, apocrine sweat is apocrine secretion. Got it? A few more bits. Erector pili muscle, you saw it in the, in the lecture notes. It's a muscle that is not controlled consciously. No, not controlled consciously. It elevates your skin hair. 
you can trigger the elevation by you now if you if it's cold or if you're scared if you're excited things like that does that make sense is there any physiological function to it zero in animals when they when their hair go up uh, it's like to seem bigger and to scare the opponent but in our case it's not that makes sense we're not going to get any bigger and we're not going to get any any warmer because the hair is so sparse. Are good so far? Nerve receptors, I don't kind of mention it because we're going to talk about nerve receptors when we get to peripheral nervous system. A couple of physiological things about the skin. First, active term regulation. When it is hot, how do you look down? What is your skin color when it's hot? Like, what happens to your skin? It gets flushed red, right? Because blood rushes to your skin to dump the heat. Does that make sense? When it's cold, it gets more pale because all those all those blood vessels constrict to conserve the heat inside of the blood. Does that make sense? And on top of that, when it's hot. You have sweat glands that produce sweat, it evaporates, you know, and you cool down. Got it? Um, there is a layer, you look at the images there, like, you know, there's a, an epidermal layer, dermal layer, and subcutaneous. Subcutaneous layer is not a part of the skin, but it's important because a lot of injections go in the subcutaneous layer. Reason for it? A lot of blood vessels. The drugs can take off them. They really well absorb in subcutaneous life. We're good so far? Any questions? To kind of briefly sum up, please. So know the structures, associate structures of the skin, hair, glands, to the degree that we just discussed here, okay? Okay? And second, um, Please know the order of the layers. What happens in each? So if I ask you know which layer has living and dividing keratinocytes, stratum design. Make sense? Which layer is found only thick skin? Stratum will see it. Got it? Okay, let's briefly break down some skin pathology. So, eczema, inflammatory condition, can arise from two inflammatory, either autoimmune response, your immune system attacks your own skin, or you just overdrive by washing your hands too much. Okay, so please be careful with all that hygiene theater. Don't overuse the soap and hand sanitizer. You can get eggs. Um, I go. Scarlet skin syndrome. And I believe I mentioned, do I mention cellulitis there? In the lectures. Uh, it's okay. So this too is, is going to be a... So in Pitago and Spalded Skins... Huh? Erysipelas? Okay, that's... Gram-positive infection. So basically, in famous staph warriors, staph, in Pitago are lesions on the skin surface. It's not bad, it just looks bad. It's a... Treatable. They don't really bother. You know. Scalded skin syndrome, epidermis and dermis are connected by the basement membrane. You follow? So if this basement membrane is destroyed by bacteria, your epidermis is going to peel off. Does that make sense? Scalded skin syndrome. 
a um, few thousand cases in newborns in the United States every year. It's treatable, just looks pretty bad, but treatable, very treatable. Erysipelas is the infection of the deeper tissues, dermis and subcutaneous tissue. It feels like a bit swollen, red, tender, and warm. Just good old inflammation. Does that make sense? Um, again, what I can ask you. Is that infectious? Is that not infectious? I give you a description, you tell me. I don't know. You know dry, dry patches of the skin, mostly autoimmune condition. Oh, that's it, right? Okay. Match the description in the term. Good? Cancers. Um, Basal cell carcinoma, um, the least, the most benign skin cancer as it can be. It is a malignancy, but it's not very invasive. It usually does not metastasize. So it's a local cancer, mostly on the face, okay? Um, if you get diagnosed, the uh, dermatologist just cuts it up. Removes it. Okay? For very treated. Squamous cell toxin. Um, can be face, scalp, ears. Okay? More invasive. Again, not too terrible, but can metastasize. Now, I have to update my lectures regularly because the data turns out latest epidemiological studies show this. These two greatly depend on your sun exposure. Does that make sense? This is why scalp and face. The most aggressive type of skin cancer, melanoma. That's the cancer that is derived from melanocytes, cells that produce that melanin. This is why melanoma, usually they are really dark, because it's basically an overgrowth of those melanocytes. It looks like melanoma is determined mostly by you know, genetics. Um, latest studies found no correlation between melanoma and the sun exposure. Does that make sense? Which doesn't mean that you should just, in the summer, get out in the sun and bake yourself to the condition of a rotisserie chicken, you know, but uh, it's, you know, it seems like, you know, the sunlight is not such a big risk factor. Is that understood? So they go from Least invasive to most invasive. Melanoma is notoriously invasive. It metastasizes like crazy. This is why early diagnostic is the key. Notice something bad, you know, something new, go to dermatologist, they'll check. Got it? Okay. We're going to talk about burns, rule of nuts. Burn, pretty. Um, first degree, epidermis is affected, redness, okay, not a big deal. Second degree, epidermis, dermis, painful, usually with the blisters, treatment, elevate the damaged limb if you can. Does that make sense? Those are recoverable. Skin will grow back. Third degree. Epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous tissue. 
all of it is dead. It's not going to grow back debridement. You have to remove the dead tissue and hope that there is enough skin for the skin grafts. Does that make sense? Fourth degree. I'm going to put gold because this is what tissues turn into. Skin is gone, completely subcutaneous fat is gone, bones and muscles are basically turned into charcoal. Obviously, amputation of whatever is, is destroyed. Does that make sense? Now, there is a rule of nine in the lecture, and I'm not going to go, so basically your body can be divided in, in sort of regions that are nines. Let me show you how it works. So it's ventral and dorsal regions, four and a half percent, four and a half percent. You following? Four and a half Four and a half. 18, 18. The leg, front of the leg is nine, back of the leg is nine. So let's say somebody burned legs, front and back. So it's nine, nine, 18, right? And another leg is 18. So 36% of the body surface is affected. Does that make sense? If you will add, or like, the, for some reason, there's only trauma. So it's going to be 18, 18, 36. You clear? If you add all of them, there's going to be 99%. 1% goes into the perineum. It's the space between the anus and external genitalia. That's 1%. So you have uh, Thresholds for critical burns, it's all there. You can look at it. What I want you to be able to, I will ask you an exam. Patient has blah, 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 regions affected. Which percent of the body surface is affected? Let's say I tell you, the patient has his face burned. Which percent? Tell me, four and a half. Okay, I promise numbers will be very well distinguished. So if you know this stuff, it's not a problem. It's an easy, it's an easy question. Am I clear? Any questions on the rule of nine since then? No, we're good. Okay. Last beat for today. I promise. And that's going to be inflammation. So main steps of inflammatory response to injury. I just want to make sense of all the schematics that you can see. This is your intact skin, okay? This is the damage. Okay? So damaged tissues start to produce inflammatory molecules. You with me? Inflammatory molecules they get in the blood vessels. And they reach your bone marrow. Now, here's what happens. In response to that inflammation, blood vessel, first and foremost, it dilates. You see how wide it is now? When it dilates, what happens to the amount of blood that flows to your injury? Huh? Increases very well. Increases, and when more blood flows to the body part, what color is this body part now? Red, yeah. When you cut yourself, you see the skin becomes reddened around the injury. That's because increased blood flow. Got it? Second, this blood brings a lot of white blood cells. Okay. 
And these white blood cells, they move into the tissue and start cleaning up the debris, destroy the pathogens, basically cleaning up the field. Does that make sense? In the meantime, especially if it's permeated the blood vessel, you get clotting factors here making a platelet flow. So these clotting factors that form a clot, they trap all potential pathogens in place, preventing them from spreading. So far, are you following? So we got redness so far. Another feature of inflammatory response is that plasma starts to leak into the peripheral tissue. Now, like, imagine that fluid from your blood gets into the tissue. When fluid gets into the tissue, what happens to the tissue? It what does it do? Huh? It, it expands, it swells. So you've got redness, you've got swelling. Does that make sense? Since all those white blood cells keep killing microbes, they produce a lot of pyrogens, molecules that increase the temperature. So now you, hit, you have heat, fever, okay? And on top of that, all this inflammatory response, swelling of the tissue, release of cytokine, release of those molecules from damaged tissue, sends this pain signal through the nerves. Does it make sense? So this is what happens when you accidentally touch yourself. You have swelling, pain, redness and warmth at the site of the injury. Does that make sense? Now the question is, are we going to fix it? So in response to this inflammatory molecules, cells of the connective tissue, fibroblasts, they start to produce collagen fibers. And collagen fibers, like little threads, they pull the ends of the wound together. They sew it together. Does it make sense to you? Once the good? So this fiber was like shoot this collagen fibers. And collagen fibers, they you know, bring connective tissue closer. Makes sense, right? And then when it's all restored and basement membrane is restored, epithelium grows back. That makes sense. Now, imagine you have a tiny little cut. It will heal. Do you see anything? It's all going to be gone, right? No traces. Because it was so narrow that this scar tissue is almost unnoticeable. Now imagine somebody has a really, really bad wound, very uneven, and nobody sews it up. Eventually, this wound will heal, right? But the problem is that the pattern of this collagen fibers will be very ugly, and you will have a massive scar. Does that make sense? So this is something like the last bit that I want you to appreciate. Inflammation in response to injury is normal. Formation of a scar tissue is normal. The problem is, scar tissue is always connective. If this is the injury to the connective tissue, fine. But what if this injury is to the muscle? So you're gonna get, instead of muscle cells, you're gonna get connective tissue stitching it back. Does that make sense? It's not good for the muscle. It's going to become weaker. Whether it's skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle. Does that make sense? Questions? So, thank you for looking at this question.